We meet today at a crossroads of history. Our world is in upheaval. In the Middle East, Iran's axis of terror confronts America, Israel, and our Arab friends. This is not a clash of civilizations. It's a clash between barbarism and civilization. It's a clash between those who glorify death and those who sanctify life. For the forces of civilization to triumph, America and Israel must stand together. Because, because when we stand together, something very simple happens. We win, they lose. And my friends, I came to assure you today of one thing. We will win. Ladies and gentlemen, like December 7, 1941, and September 11, 2001, October 7 is a day that will forever live in infamy. It was the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah. It began as a perfect day, not a cloud in the sky. Thousands of young Israelis were celebrating at an outdoor music festival. And suddenly, at 6.29 a.m., as children were still sleeping soundly in their beds in the towns in Kibbutzim next to Gaza, suddenly, heaven turned into hell. 3,000 Hamas terrorists stormed into Israel. They butchered 1,200 people from 41 countries, including 39 Americans. Proportionately, compared to our population size, that's like 29 11s in one day. And these monsters, they raped women, they beheaded men, they burned babies alive, they killed parents in front of their children, and children in front of their parents, they dragged 255 people, both living and dead, into the dark dungeons of Gaza. Israel has already brought home 135 of these hostages, including seven who were freed in daring rescue operations. My friends, defeating our brutal enemies requires both courage and clarity. Clarity begins by knowing the difference between good and evil. Yet incredibly, many anti-Israel protesters, many choose to stand with evil. They stand with Hamas. They stand with rapists and murderers. They stand with people who came into the kibbutzim, into a home. The parents hid the children, the two babies, in the attic, in a secret attic. They murder the families, the parents. They find the secret latch to the hidden attic, and then they murder the babies. These protesters stand with them. They should be ashamed of themselves.
They refuse to make the simple distinction between those who target terrorists and those who target civilians, between the democratic state of Israel and the terrorist thugs of Hamas. We recently learned from the national security director, director of U.S. Director of National Intelligence, that Iran is funding and promoting anti-Israel protests in America. They want to disrupt America. So these protesters burn American flags even on the 4th of July. And I wish to salute the fraternity brothers at the University of North Carolina who protected the American flag, protected the American flag against these anti-Israel protesters. For all we know, Iran is funding the anti-Israel protests that are going on right now outside this building. Not that many, but they're there and throughout the city. Well, I have a message for these protesters. When the tyrants of Tehran, who hang gays from cranes and murder women for not covering their hair, are praising, promoting, and funding you, you have officially become Iran's useful idiots. Some of these protesters, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Some of these protesters hold up signs proclaiming gays for Gaza. They might as well hold up signs saying chickens for KFC. These protesters chant from the river to the sea, but many don't have a clue what river and what sea they're talking about. They not only get an F in geography, they get an F in history. They call Israel, they call Israel a colonial state. Don't they know that the land of Israel is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob prayed, where Isaiah and Jeremiah preached, and where David and Solomon ruled? For nearly 4,000 years, the land of Israel has been the homeland of the Jewish people. It's always been our home. It will always be our home. My friends, in the Middle East, Iran is virtually beyond, behind all the terrorism, all the turmoil, all the chaos, all the killing. And that should come as no surprise. When he founded the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini pledged, we will export our revolution to the entire world. We will export the Islamic revolution to the entire world. Now ask yourself, which country ultimately stands in the way of Iran's maniacal plans to impose radical Islam on the world? And the answer is clear. It's America, the guardian of Western civilization and the world's greatest power. That's why Iran sees America as its greatest enemy. Last month, we heard a, a revealing comment, ostensibly about the war in Gaza, but about something else. It came from the foreign minister of Iran's proxy, Hezbollah, and he said this, this is not a war with Israel. Israel, he said, is merely a tool. 
The main war, the real war, is with America. Iran's regime has been fighting America from the moment it came to power. In 1979, it stormed the American embassy. It held scores of Americans hostage for 444 days. Since then, Iran's terrorist proxies have targeted America in the Middle East and beyond. In Beirut, they killed 241 U.S. servicemen. In Africa, they bombed American embassies. In Iraq, they supplied explosives to maim and kill thousands of American soldiers. In America, in America, they actually sent death squads. They sent death squads here to murder a former Secretary of State and a former National Security Advisor. And as we recently learned, they even brazenly threatened to assassinate President Trump. But Iran understands that to truly challenge America, it must first conquer the Middle East. And for this, it uses its many proxies, including the Houthis, Hezbollah, and Hamas. Yet in the heart of the Middle East, standing in Iran's way, is one proud pro-American democracy, my country, the State of Israel. That's why, that's why the mobs in Tehran chant death to Israel before they chant death to America. For Iran, Israel is first, America is next. So when Israel fights Hamas, we're fighting Iran. When we fight Hezbollah, we're fighting Iran. When we fight the Houthis, we're fighting Iran. And when we fight Iran, we're fighting the most radical and murderous enemy of the United States of America. And one more thing, when Israel acts to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons that could destroy Israel and threaten every American city, every city that you come from, we're not only protecting ourselves, we're protecting you. The day, the day after we defeat Hamas, a new Gaza can emerge. My vision for that day is of a demilitarized and de-radicalized Gaza. Israel does not seek to resettle Gaza, but for the foreseeable future, we must retain overriding security control there to prevent the resurgence of terror, to ensure that Gaza never again poses a threat to Israel. Gaza should have a civilian administration run by Palestinians who do not seek to destroy Israel. That's not too much to ask. It's a, it's a fundamental thing that we have a right to demand and to receive. A new generation of Palestinians must no longer be taught to hate Jews, but rather to live in peace with us. Those twin words, demilitarization and de-radicalization, those two concepts were applied to Germany and Japan after World War II, and that led to decades of peace, prosperity, and security. <laughs> following our victory, following our victory with the help of regional partners, the demilitarization and de-radicalization of Gaza can also lead to a future of security, prosperity, and peace. That's my vision for Gaza. Now here's my vision for the broader Middle East. It's also shaped in part by what we saw in the aftermath of World War II. After that war, America forged a security alliance in Europe to counter the growing Soviet threat. Likewise, America and Israel today can forge a security alliance in the Middle East to counter the growing Iranian threat. All countries that are at peace with Israel 
and all those countries who will make peace with Israel should be invited to join this alliance. We saw a glimpse, we saw a glimpse of that potential alliance on April 14th. Led by the United States, more than half a dozen nations worked alongside Israel to help neutralize hundreds of missiles and drones launched by Iran against us. Thank you, President Biden, for bringing that coalition together. The new alliance I envision would be a natural extension of the groundbreaking Abraham Accords. Those accords saw peace forged between Israel and four Arab countries, and they were supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. We could call. I have a name for this new alliance. I think we should call it the Abraham Alliance. I want to thank President Trump for his leadership in brokering the historic Abraham Accords. Like Americans, Israelis were relieved that President Trump emerged safe and sound from that dastardly attack on him dastardly attack on American democracy. There is no room for political violence in democracies. I also want to thank President Trump for all the things he did for Israel, from recognizing Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights to confronting Iran's aggression to recognizing Jerusalem as our capital and moving the American embassy there. That's Jerusalem, our eternal capital, never to be divided again. My dear friends, Democrats and Republicans, despite these times of upheaval, I'm hopeful about the future. I'm hopeful about Israel because my people, the Jewish people, emerged from the depths of hell, from dispossession and genocide. And against all odds, we restored our sovereignty in our ancient homeland. We built a powerful and vibrant democracy a democracy that pushes the boundaries of innovation for the betterment of all humanity. I'm hopeful about America because I'm hopeful about Americans. I know how much the people of this country have sacrificed to defend freedom. America will be continued to be a force for light and good in a dark and dangerous world. For free peoples everywhere, America remains the beacon of liberty its extraordinary founders envisioned back in 1776. <laughs> Working together, I'm confident that our two nations will vanquish the tyrants and terrorists who threaten us both. As Israel's Prime Minister, I promise you this. No matter how long it takes, no, how, no matter how difficult the road ahead, Israel will not relent. Israel will not bend. We will defend our land. We will defend our people. We will fight until we achieve victory. Victory over liberty, rather victory of liberty over tyranny, victory of life over death, victory of good over evil. That's our solemn commitment.
and we will continue to work with the United States and our Arab partners to transform a troubled region from a backwater of repression, poverty, and war into a thriving oasis of dignity, prosperity, and peace. In this noble mission, as in many others, Israel will always remain America's indispensable ally. Through thick and thin, Through thick and thin, in good times and in bad, Israel will always be your loyal friend and your steadfast partner. On behalf of the people of Israel, I came here today to say thank you, America. Thank you for your support and solidarity. Thank you for standing in Israel, with Israel, in our hour of need. Together, together we shall defend our common civilization. Together, we shall secure a brilliant future for both our nations. May God bless Israel, may God bless America, and may God bless the great alliance between Israel and America forever.